<laughs> All right, thank you for bearing with us while we switched computers over. So thanks everybody for coming out tonight for Aquatic Invasive Species of the Coast Fork Willamette Watershed, presented by Cottage Grove's very own Doug Garlitz. Doug is a professional fish biologist within the Willamette Basin uh, for over 20 years. He also spearheads our annual water oozel cleanup float, and this past June marked our 13th year of that activity. It has made such a difference. I don't know how many tires have been pulled out of the river, um, tires and shopping carts and all sorts of stuff, <gasps> bait, yes. <laughs> so 13 years of that, hopefully we can keep going for a while longer. Um, I also want to recognize Doug for his contribution to teaching uh, students, middle school students from the Child's Way School. He teaches them every year for our fish lesson. He's our guest expert for that. So thank you, Doug, for contributing to such great causes and just in general, your involvement with the Watershed Council. There are few people with as much passion for rivers, fish, and this watershed than Doug. This presentation will provide an, an overview of invasive reptiles, fish, and mammals in our watershed and in Oregon, including some species that could po pose future problems. And with that, we are excited to welcome Doug to si the Science Pub stage, and let's give him a warm welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for coming out, everybody. Well, that's a bullfrog right there, and he's got a rat in his mouth. Okay, so I'm a fish guy, everybody. Here's my disclaimer. I'm a fish guy. I'm salmocentric, ESA, why, the Endangered Species Act is why I have a job. So going after an, an uh, invasive aquatics is a challenge. To me, it's a socioeconomic problem greater than a scientific problem, if you ask me. Um, so there's my disclaimer. Like I'm saying, I'm no expert. Uh, I'm just trying to grasp how to attack this. So this is uh, our local watershed within the Willamette watershed. We're right there. Uh, the Coast Fork meets the Middle Fork Willamette up here near Goshen. Um, if you head upstream, you come through town, you go up the Coast Fork to the, co the uh, Coast Fork Reservoir and on up into the headwaters. Just downstream of town, we have the Rau meets the Coast Fork to form the proper co Coast Fork. So if you head up the Rau River, you hit Dorena Dam, Dorena Reservoir, and then you head on up to the forks of the Rau, uh, Sharps, Bryce, Lang. I'm going to focus from the reservoirs down. Uh, there's a, a shot of uh, Cottage Grove Reservoir and Dorena Reservoir, uh, both completed in the 40s. Uh, small inland seas, basically. What likes to live there? Uh, warm water fish species, especially. I don't know if anybody in the room recognizes this spot, uh, but this is a, a great spot. This is where we put in for the, the river cleanup every year. This is the nature park. The Watershed Council and all of you and everyone uh, has in the communities really worked hard to restore this area, former borrow pits, uh, for the creation of I-5 is what I remember. Um, but this is a good, a good example of vectors, vectors for non-natives. How do non-natives get into uh, an area or a water body? Does anybody know? It's us. Usually it's us, one way or another. Uh, a great place to get, let's say, an invasive seed, invasive animal into the water is that a river crossing, a boat ramp, any access point, somebody's backyard, dumping something in the, in the river, uh, anywhere you can pull over next to the road, um, pretty much up and down your drainage corridors, uh, especially during a flood, that's kind of unintentional, but you might just have some ivy sitting in the backyard next to your creek, high water comes, next thing you know it's downstream into a bigger water body. The wind can carry uh, a seed, for instance, or parts of, an, of a plant that could, uh, that could go on to thrive, hitchhiking on a duck or as a seed on a, a fur of an animal or an example of something carried by an animal. Uh, construction activities, the lugs of, of knobby tires, again, overland. Anyway, this, this isn't a complete list. If anybody has any ideas, any other ideas of how 
how uh, invasives get vectored into our habitats, uh, please feel free to sh share with me if you have any of those ideas. Maybe after the talk we can talk about that. But yeah, boat, boat ramps. There's nobody there watching the boat ramp to see, to see what we're bringing into the, into the area. Uh, this is the same location just upstream, and I, I just wanted to emphasize it's a river crossing, Rao River Road crossing the Rao below Darina, about five miles downstream of Darina. And just think about how easy it would be to, to dump something into the river that wasn't native or accidentally go into the river, fly out of the back of a truck, for instance. Or maybe you're sick of your snapping turtle or your bullfrog pet that you bought on eBay or whatever. Your goldfish, you might just throw it into the river right there because you can just pull up. It happens. Um, this is a, a view of one of the borrow pits at uh, the nature park. This is the, one of the trout ponds full of bass and bluegill. Um, just think about that. People love these animals. They're not native. They're warm water species. But there's the conundrum. We love these non-natives. We love to fish for them, but they're not really helpful to the native biota. Uh, here's a plan aerial view of that same place. Those first those couple slides I just showed, here's the crossing, there's the boat ramp. Uh, that pond I just showed you is up here. Here's the water treatment plant, the new one. But this is just to kind of show you the style of the river below Darina Dam and Darina Reservoir, the style of the row, and just to kind of show you the, the uh, repairing corridor, which I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I'm going to be talking about in the water, up on the floodplain, and in between. So you have your main aquatic corridor, the main channel, all the side channels, backwaters, off channel features like these ponds, which are only ephemerally connected or connected seasonally or never even. But you could, because of the, the terraces are kind of flat here, you could argue that this whole riparian corridor from the aquatic zone to the riparian to the uplands, the uplands could be considered way up here. So you could call this the whole riparian corridor. So if you look at the floods that happened this last spring, the, this, this area was inundated, well inundated. Obviously, we revetted it to save Sears Road, to save Rao River Road, but the river filled this area in this past spring. So there's a transport. Just to zoom out a little, this is just downstream of town. Here's uh, the dirt track, oops. The dirt track would be right here, the racetrack. Here's the route coming in. Here's the Coast Fork just downstream of the sewage treatment plant coming in. 99 heading to Cresswell. Um, and here's that little peninsula the city had purchased, I can't remember how many years ago, but old borrow pits, great, uh, great habitat for all kinds of waterfowl and other creatures. But just to show you the style, once you get down here, kind of below town and even above town, but below uh, during the dam, you get into the area where the river's been channelized, riprap. It's the Army Corps placed rock to get, get the water out of there as quickly as possible. So that's kind of the style of, of what you're seeing here for, uh, for the landscape down there. Farther down, zooming farther out, and I'm sorry, this isn't a better picture, but here's, here's Cresswell and, Cl and Cloverdale. The river kind of just mainly is confined to one channel all the way up, going under 58, up, slams into Mount Pisgah, goes around and meets the Middle Fork here. Old, old uh, aggregate mining borrow pits. But really, the, the river is confined to that main channel. Few off water, off uh, channel habitats, but really main channel. But the water and the animals do get into all these habitats, especially if they're a frog, which can travel overland. Here's a simplified idea of what I was just talking about, uh, but just kind of graphically. Uh, so the river around here again, the repairing corridor. You have the main cross section of the river channel. You get up into the riparian zone, and then you head up, and the whole corridor is kind of in that lower elevation, which the river may inundate uh, at high seasonally, and then into the uplands. Uh, this is a representation of this cross section, but in the plan view, looking down, you might have an off-channel pond, you might have a, a tributary junction come in, and then the main river like this. But there's all kinds of avenues for aquatic uh, 
invasives to, to come in or vector in. So invasive versus non-native or exotic. Well, this is how the state defines invasive species. This, the, the Oregon Conservation Strategy, which is kind of how we're, as a state, going to try to address these non-natives, try to preserve our natives, is, uh, I can read this to you. Um, it uses a definition based on the ORS statute, uh, 57 or 570.755, you know, that kind of stuff. Non-native organisms that cause economic or, environment or environmental harm and are capable of spreading to new areas of the state. Invasive species does not include humans. <laughs> Again, lo lawyers wrote this. Um, domestic livestock, whatever's convenient, basically. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start out with the species. Everybody's asked me what's the worst, what's the best, what's the least worst. I don't know. This is a bad one, though. The, bull, oh, the American bullfrog's kind of bad. One of the bad things about the bullfrog, a voracious eater. Anything that'll fit in its mouth, it'll eat. Uh, another advantage that this species has is that it can go overland between water bodies. Also, if its, in a, it's, if its eggs are in an isolated pool, which is going to dry up someday, any fish that are in there will eventually die when it dries up, but the tadpoles become polywogs. They can walk over land, and they can go and invade another area. Each female can produce up to 20,000 eggs. But it, you can go through here. It, it feeds on our natives. It feeds on our non-natives. It feeds on fish. It feeds on mammals. Anything it can fit in its mouth. Here's our natives, which are the, the two that, that uh, Maggie was mentioning, the yellow, uh, the foothill yellow-legged uh, frog and the northern red-legged frog. Those guys are both sensitive species. And then our tree frog, bullfrog eats all these guys. You can find them right here, around here. Uh, bullfrog eat all these guys, and they do. So heading up to Darina and to uh, uh, Coast Fork Reservoir, most of these species are present in both those reservoirs. Both the, uh, most of these species are, well, these are all exotics, but most of them are warm water species that thrive in the Mississippi drainage. Back east where I grew up in West Virginia, all that drainage, these species are native, the majority of them. Uh, not your carp, not your mosquito fish, but everybody else. And the big thing about these animals, they can tolerate warm water. And as the climate gets warmer, our salmon, our trout, they're getting kicked out of the place. So here's the ODFW conundrum. They are, their mission, ODFW, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's mission is to preserve native uh, flora and fauna. Well, native fish get eaten by these guys, yet ODFW wants to promote these fisheries because they're great fisheries. Everybody loves to bass fish. A lot of people do. You've seen all the bass boats around Cottage Grove. Um, it's a hit, so are we going to get rid of all these guys just to get the natives in? It's highly unlikely, kind of pointing to the socioeconomic issue we're looking at more than the, the biology. But all these species are present around here in our basin or adjacent. The walleye, which is a big fish eater, you've heard about them on the Columbia eating salmon, smolts. They're in the middle fork, which uh, means they can swim right up here. There's nothing keeping them from swimming past the bar here. Some of our native fish that those warm water fish eat. I'm not going to go through them all. I just listed a bunch of them. But our trout, our Chinook salmon, the only native salmon to the upper Willamette because of Willamette Falls, the only time it was ever uh, passable before a fish ladder was during the spring. Salmon are named after the time of year that they run. Spring Chinook, our only native salmon. Well, bass like to eat their babies. Oh, wrong one. Bass like to eat their babies. Uh, brook lamprey, our native resident lamprey, Pacific lamprey, um, large scale suckers, three spine stickleback, red side shiners, Oregon chub, just got off the endangered species lick, list, hooray, sculpin species, sand rollers, the dace, mountain white fish, northern pike minnow, trout, back to trout. All these fish are native and can be found around here. All these fish are. Uh, preyed upon or displaced by non-natives and other natives. On to plants. I'm going to kind of blast through a lot of species here, but you can find all these species right here in town. You can find them all up and down the Coast Fork, especially 
below and around the impoundments, around CG Reservoir, around uh, uh, Darena and downstream. The knotweed, pollinators love these things. Unfortunately, they're so invasive, they're, it's so hard to get rid of. The English ivy, the vinca, the periwinkle, a couple of our local uh, uh, plant vendors were selling these up to two years ago. People like the vinca, it, it grows on disturbed ground like a new construction site. Like if you just build a house, you can have pretty flowers, green foliage like that. In fact, it's uh, so successful. The successfulness equals its invasiveness. That's why it sells. <laughs> the reed canary grass, uh, if you've ever taken a walk around any of the impoundments, especially in the winter, when the water's down, that's what's dominating the monoculture of the drawdown zone is the reed canary grass. Uh, basket weavers, uh, maybe West Messenger, who's a very smart botanist over there, can c tell you some secondary uses. Maybe you can make baskets out of it, I don't know. Um, our, our blackberry, our Armenian, also known as Himalayan blackberry, super yummy. I have a pie in my fridge half eaten right now. <laughs> anyway, you, these, are, these species aren't necessarily in the water, in the aqua zone, but they're in the riparian, and they can take it over. They can choke out everything. You'll have monoculture of these guys all along the river corridor, wherever, wherever their stems, their rhizomes, their seeds can get. And so if you take a walk or a float down our local rivers, you will see these, and often in big monocultures. For instance, this is the Coast Fork coming in to CG Reservoir, uh, in the Cottage Grove Reservoir. This is just upstream of the bridge. Now, there is a, a, the road's crossing here, so I can't say this is typical of a reach of river between uh, vector points, such as a road, because obviously a road is crossing a bridge here just below, just downstream of that, of the word Coast Fork there. So you might have a, a, a magnified impact here, but still, it, it's a good illustration of how these monocultures can drown out the riparian. This blackberry is choking out the ash, choking out the alder up here, choking out the willow. Go to the other side of the, of the river up there, the reed canary grass is taking everything over except down to the gravel bar where the yearly fluctuations can wash it away. So who knows what's living under this still, if anything, that, uh, any natives. This is in town. This is what I call the riparian non-native salad area. This is over by Great Days on River Road. You have the ivy, you have the vinca, you have the blackberry in here. You have some horsetails that are native. Um, you have ivy climbing the trees over here and down along the shore you have bits of reed canary grass. It's choking everything out. Down into the water we've got a whole bunch that are here or could be coming here. They're very close, high potential. Um, just like the riparian animals that drown everything out, the natives out, or the, the riparian plants that drown out all of the natives with the monoculture, these have the ability to displace the natives down in the water. Uh, the LOD is around here, you can find that in backwaters especially, and any slow moving water that enters into the river from the side. The hydrilla is around here, the pond weeds around here, the, the millifoils around, foils around here, this is around here, the, the uh, mosquito fern, I'm pretty sure, again, I'm no botanist, but I've seen it. The uh, yellow flag iris, the water iris is around here. Parrot's feather, yes. Uh, the Lawigia, I think I'm saying that right, isn't here yet, but it's, it's bound to be here soon. The sponge plants in California are bound to get here soon. The floating heart is downriver in the main Willamette, if I remember cor correctly. So, be on the lookout for these guys and report them if you see them. <sighs> Some of these guys up here, old news, uh, it may be too late. On to mammals. Good old nutria. You can eat them. They're kind of cute, but they're kind of detrimental. They were brought in for, to replace uh, the mink is what I was uh, taught. But they, they're voracious eaters and they wreak havoc on your riparian plants. They also, they burrow into levees. They cause all kinds of expensive uh, uh, destruction, which people don't like. Um, anyway, they're everywhere. To amphibians, uh, back to the turtles. We got the good, the bad, and the ugly here. 
You got our native pond turtle. You got the slider. And you got the, uh, the snapping turtle, the good, the ugly, and the bad. These guys will eat anything. These guys displace the native uh, through competition. But if you see this one or you see this one, here's the word. This is supposed to be a red, a red patch right there. Again, like uh, Maggie was saying, the, the color didn't come through very good. But anyway, just be aware of these guys and then enjoy these guys. You'll see these guys basking at the nature park uh, out on the logs in the middle of the day. Um, anyway, we want to promote these guys and we want to let whomever uh, know the watershed council if you see these guys anywhere in the watershed. On to the mollusks. Um, this is the Asian clam, the corbicula. It's everywhere. The reason I brought this one up, it, it is in the Coast Fork. Uh, we found some in Saginaw on our last garbage float in June. Um, they're just starting to get established. But the thing about them is that they can fix they can fix minerals out of the water to make shells. And there's a big argument about zebra and quagga mussels not being able to take a foothold around here because there's not enough dissolved minerals in the water. Well, these guys are finding a way to get minerals out of the water for shells. They say that a zebra or a quagga mussel might secondarily be able to get, to get the minerals out of the water from these shells dissolving. I don't know, just saying that. But that, you'll see this around here. This one often gets confused with zebra quagga as being, uh, oh no, an alert. It seems like the impact of the corbicula, from what I've noticed, being a fish guy going out isn't horrible, but I, I can't say that uh, for a fact. Here's a picture of your, of your zebra and your quagga mussels. They're not here yet, but if they get here, if you want to refer to what has happened in the Great Lakes and their influence biofouling, filtering everything out of the water, all the plankton out of the water, leaving it sterile, huge impacts. But the biofiling alone, it could clog all the infrastructure water flows if the, any of these species get here. We have them in California. We have them one mountain over from the drainage divide for the Upper Snake River. That question that uh, Maggie s asked about the uh, vectoring in, every year we find boats coming into the state from every direction with these, these guys on them and they're alive. Just getting ready to head up to CG or Dorena and go in the water to go water skiing with these guys on board. The New Zealand mud sl snail, uh, again, the numbers of them, they're, they're teeny, but you can see that quarter or dime, whatever it is, teeny, but they're sheer numbers because they reproduce as clones. It can just take all the nutrients out of the system. It's horrible. Chinese mystery snail, again, compete with our natives. Uh, uh, mollusks. Um, I haven't seen any of these in the Coast Fork, but they're they're at they're in the middle fork at the base of Dexter Dam. There's nothing keeping them from coming here. It's one of my favorite pictures of quagga mussels down in Lake Mead. <laughs> the thing about quagga mussels that's different than than uh, zebra mussels is that they can live deep. They can they don't need sunlight really to reproduce and thrive like the zebra does, but that's just a set of sunglasses that was in Lake Mead for two years. Here's one of our native mussels. Uh, these are all over the, the around the Coast Fork, our Margaritifera falcata, the uh, western pearl shell. It's great. Just wanted to throw one of those up there to show you. There's a couple more ridged and floaters that are around here too, but these are the most prevalent. Enjoy these guys. They're all over. If you go out snorkeling or boating, you'll see these everywhere. We want these. Over to crayfish, uh, you've seen this in the trivia t as well. Um, this is the new arrival, non-native, who, who came from the other side of the Rockies, the ringed, and the easy way to tell the ring from all the rest is these black tips on their claws. First thing I would look for. Our native up here, our signal, again, it's a poor picture, but right in the hinge of the claw, there's a bright spot. And they're kind of, kind of more red, whereas the ringed are brown. Um, swamps are in Fern Ridge and the Long Tom in abundance, abundance. I'm not sure about rusties, but I haven't seen them in any of the invasive species reports in the state. But uh, yeah, they can displace our sole uh, crayfish. Uh, anyway, these guys are in the Umpqua, these guys are in the Rogue. So surprise, surprise, they showed up here in, tw in uh, 2015, uh, just upstream of or in 
Darina. Ouch. This is I thought was interesting. I don't know how old this law is, but this is from the Oregon State Marine Board. So let's just say you're a fisherman and you want to you want to keep your crawdads that you're hucking at bass. Well, if you take them from let's just say you take them from Darina and you head up to, to Cougar Reservoir, you to Hills Creek, and the Oregon State Police game warden catches you, you can be fined that amount, 125k if you got that sitting around, or the cost of restoring the waterway. That's pretty vague. I don't know what the cheaper deal is. <laughs> Probably expensive. There's us, not to be a hypocrite, but are we exotic, non-native, or invasive? I don't know. <laughs> Neither, none. So here we go. This is kind of where it's really what messes with me is like, how do we go about dealing with non-natives? What, what is the state that we want to get to? What are our goals? Are we pissing in the wind? Is it, is it over? Is it too late? I don't know. That's why I'm here to ask everybody their opinions because I still, as a fish guy, Salmo-centric fish guy, I'm trying to wrap my head around this mess. I mean, it is the melting pot. You could look at it that way and everything's peachy, but it's hard to be a purist, isn't it, right? Um, maybe they're not from Mars or Saturn. Like we got that much going for us. But yeah, how to, how to go about quantifying, qualifying this whole mess, you know? Is it education awareness? Is it our attitude? Is it money? H how do we try to put it in a box? You know, what, where, the magnitude of, of their invasiveness? What do we do, surveys? How do we triage? What's more important? The native crayfish, the native fish, the native plants? What's the mammals? What's, th what's the most important? Do we throw it at a dartboard, darts at a dartboard and call that good? I don't know. It would be sad if it came down to what's worth the most. Bath, bass and warm water fish are worth a lot of money economically, but they're not native. Um, you know, the vectors, well, you know, if we're gonna do triage or we're gonna say time out, let's stop what's going on and see where we are, we gotta figure out how they're coming in so we don't know, we, we prevent them from coming in anymore. Like that picture I showed of the nature park and the boat ramp, that's so close to I-5. It's like right there. Somebody could just drive up from wherever, that, from Mexico with a whole bunch of stuff and just dump them in the river on accident, whatever, wash their boat. Nobody's there. Um, how do we, if we have established populations of non-natives, what do we do? Mechanical, chemical, biological treatment. A lot of people like chemicals because it's effective. You know, Roundup is effective. It's not, the, it's not the prettiest thing, but it's effective. Um, what's greater for the, the whole ecosystem? Or do we want to work on just portions? It's a big picture thing. And we have pretty short lifespans. We can feel good about what we're doing, but by by the time we're old and dead, it may have already been, all progress might have been wiped out. So this is stuff to, to think about. Um, I don't have any answers. I'm still, all I'm doing is getting more questions the farther I dive into this as just a bucket bio, fish biologist. Oops, sorry. All right, this is kind of cool. This just, I just read about this. Here's a biological control for the knotweed that just came out, and I don't know how good this is or not, but the USDA just approved this as a treatment, a biological treatment for knotweed. And it's this animal that's native to where the knotweed's from, it, from Japan. Imagine that. So the question is, do we just let these things go? I don't know if they're sterile or not, but do we let them go to, uh, and sick them on our knotweed? Maybe they're gonna go eat all the willow, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's happened, we've, we've done this, we've been through this before, uh, taking a biological control that then all of a sudden went out of control. But uh, this Japanese knotweed, so it's a pretty cool thing. The USDA just said, go for it. That was back east. It's a problem back east, the knotweed. So there's lots of resources where you can learn about what lives here, about controls, who to talk to, who to network with. <laughs> Number one is your watershed council. I would start there. They're the ultimate hub of networking. You're out there on the river, you're driving along, you see something foreign, you've been living there for 20 years, all of a sudden you see a new flower, big monoculture of flower, never seen it before. You, you pull over, you can't ID it, it's not native. Talk to your watershed council. 
call ODFW. Network, look on the web, state and federal uh, resources on there. Look in the Long Tom, talk to the Long Tom Watershed Council, the Middle Fork Watershed Council, everybody adjacent around us, we're all working together because we're all connected basically. If we're below a dam, we're really connected. This is great, a great place to start uh, with ODFW in the state. The, the Oregon Conservation Strategy website can really update you on all kinds of non-natives. Mammals, fish, plants, you name it, bugs, whatever. It's great, great stuff. I learned so much going on there. Oregon State Marine Board, they go through the ones, the, the aquatic invasives, they have their propaganda up there really trying to dr drill it into everybody's head, look out for these things, don't bring them in, don't bring more of them in. You know, this one's not here yet, the zebra quag is not here yet, a lot of these are here already. But still, education, education, education. Um, Oregon State Extension Service. This used to be orange and black. I don't know what the uh, what the projector is doing, but anyway, that's your local extension service through OSU. Lots of great information about about ag, uh, uh, plant, animals, insects, etc. That that are good or bad. I love these guys, the Portland State Center for uh, Lakes and Reservoirs, humongously helpful folks. Call them, get on their website, great, great resource. Oregon Department of Agriculture, um, they're well aware of the uh, noxious weeds, especially in our waterways. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a broader perspective, countrywide, the feds, but still good stuff. Uh, USGS, this is really interesting, they're, they're a non-indigenous aqu aquatic species program. You can go on there and you can report something you found. You can find out about non-native species based on state and also even to wa uh, species or even water body through their, through their filtering system. But if you see something weird, you see a, a, a ring crayfish up at Bryce Creek, they, uh, you could put it on there and let everybody know. I would keep it local though, if you find something non-native, I would start with the Watershed Council because they're going to raise the flag and get the word out and then that will disseminate as opposed to going some obscure database and putting your info in there. It will never be looked at, only by a few people. But anyway, that's available. You, a lot of good information about other places. Uh, the Department of Agriculture, U.S. Department of Ag Agriculture, a lot of good stuff. You can learn about vectoring there, pretty good. Another great website. And like I was just saying, um, if you see something, if you have any questions, you know, start local. I would start local. It's your, the bang for the buck. You're going to have, if you're going to be retelling the story over and over and over to people, it'd be nice to talk to a human who knows where you live, knows the quality of the habitat you're talking about, knows the species, and also knows the uh, potential local impact of the species. So I would start local. ODFW Springfield, I used to work for them uh, as a fish biologist, great folks, caring folks. Our Watershed Council, the town, Cottage Grove and Cresswell, along our rivers. The Army Corps, especially if you call the Ranger's Office, which is located up at, at CG Reservoir. Local Forest Service, the Umpqua Ranger Stations, right up Robert Road, past the Nature Park, past Killian's. Local BLM, you get a hold of them in Springfield. Portland State, there's all, they also, the Center for Lakes Reservoirs has the Lake Watch uh, website, the Extension Service, all local. Even if they're feds, they have local offices. And then I think the, uh, the, we're the key here. We work for free a lot of times. We have the eyes that are on the ground because we live here. Um, we're not sent out on a survey. Being, we're not on the clock. We, we, this is our backyard. I think we're pretty much the most uh, powerful. So support your watershed council and local conservation uh, organizations by volunteering. Um, giving, them, giving them three or four of those frappuccinos that you could have bought. Give them that money. Get educated, get involved, communicate and get outside and look around, just don't read books. <laughs> so this is from, I saw this from uh, 2014, the Institute of Pi Applied Ecology, kind of turning it, you know, maybe turn this problem into a benefit somehow, I don't know, uh, turn it into a gold bar, whatever, feed yourself. Blackberries, they're yummy. Here's your, here's your Hearty, your heart healthy crock pot nutria recipe. <laughs> I mean, that looks good. Two hind saddle portions, you get that. 
From what I understand, you don't need a license or anything to get them. <laughs> um, all these yummy things from your garden. There you go. Yeah, here. Uh, chili, chili, chili. I vote for chili. And that's it for my, for my presentation. I'm up for questions, but main, mainly discussion. That's why I'm here. Thank you. So that's a great question, Allison. That, I don't know if everyone heard that, but you're in a conundrum there. You need the non-native to support the native. How do we go best go about that? And that's, I don't have that answer. Um, maybe there's some folks that are experienced with these pollinators and the plants they depend on that might have the best path forward to not waste time and money. That's about strategy. It's kind of where I'm coming at. And, that's what, why it's going to take communications and some research, which is money and time, getting young people involved, getting old people, middle people, whoever involved, uh, education. About the only thing I could say about that, because it's not simple. It's a tangled mess. Yeah. From what I understand, they've eradicated the Tui Chub, from what I understand. Oh, yeah, sorry. The, so I don't know if you guys remember, the Tui Chub was introduced to Diamond Lake, headwaters of the Umpqua, I forget how many years ago, as a bait fish. Well, it took over and it ate all the plankton. And it, it, it killed, it essentially sterilized the lake. Well, they went to eradicate, and I, I forget how they exactly eradicated the Tui Chub, whether it was trapping, poisoning. I thought it was rotenone, rotenone poisoning. From what I understand, that eradication effort of the Tui Chub in, in Diamond Lake was a success. Now, I haven't heard what's happened since, but if you go on ODFW webpage, they considered it a great success. Yeah, like no presence of Tui Chub anymore. Yeah, so what her question was is that on her property, she usually, every spring here is huge choruses of frogs, and this year it was less, and I don't know. That could be seasonal. Who knows? It could be a uh, population dynamic that goes like this. They may have found something. They may have gone overland. I don't know. It just You need to keep, maybe give it a greater time span if you could look at it over 10 years, or you could get out and try to study it, or ID what's there. Did you even know what species are there? The chorus frogs, the tree frogs are really noisy, different song than a bullfrog, for instance. It'd be nice if the bullfrogs left. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, guys, I am open to, oh, go ahead. Yeah, and so that's a good one, that's a good one. So I, I struggle with that one. Yes, what's the difference between invasive non-native and exotic. And you know, I, I struggled with that one. Invasive to me, it seems like what like the state of Oregon defined is ability to do harm over a widespread area. That's what it seems like to me as invasive. Exotic may be an animal that is isolated, but doesn't necessarily cause a lot of harm. They're all non-native. That's kind of the way I would grip it. The magnitude of destruction is how I would look at it. If they're isolated, if they have the potential to do great damage over a broad great geographical area without even bringing money into it, but obviously money is there, I would say it's invasive. That, that would, I would say it's a yes or no, invasive or not really. Or 
maybe going from being exotic, non-native, on down the road to invasive. But some exotics may never be invasive. So I think you need a big time span to really assess that. That'd be my guess. Any other questions? I am going to be around to share my resources, so uh, I thank you guys for coming. Thank you very much. That was fun.